Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mir Weiner, the director of the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies here at Stanford. And it is my pleasure to invite today, to introduce today, Professor Donis Hours, a repeat offender. This is his second visit to Stanford within a few months. Professor Donis Hours is literally the authority of the government and politics of post-Soviet Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. His book on this very topic is a staple in the studies of the post-Soviet space in this region. He's uh, educated, he was educated in the University of uh, London, the University College of London. This is his second uh, Fulbright uh, Award here in this country, which is quite a rare honor. Uh, this year at the University of Washington in Seattle. And today he will talk about the first, uh, the, so the first step of his uh, project, uh, still uh, in process, about national stereotypes in the Baltic and the Nordic uh, region. Something that everyone is an expert uh, about, national stereotypes, and nobody knows anything. And we learned today a lot from uh, Professor Hours. Always a pleasure having you here. The one thing that I would say, we a little bit misled you about the conversation. It would be mainly a, a lecture, and I will moderate the uh, questions and answer later on. You're almost welcome. So, uh, Amir, thank you for those very kind words, and, and thank you to everybody who found the time from their busy schedules to come here. I see there are some familiar faces, some uh, unfamiliar uh, ones. Um, so, yes, so, so today I'm talking about a, a project which has been on my mind for quite some time, um, but in a very sort of blurry, sketchy sort of way. But I've had the opportunity now, um, over the last couple of months, um, sitting in uh, Seattle uh, at the University of Washington at the fantastic Department of Scandinavian Studies to think about these issues a little bit more, to read up on the things like stereotype theory and region building theory and so on, um, which I, I hadn't um, engaged with so much more, to try to put some uh, flesh around the bones of an uh, idea. So that's what I'll be talking about today. I, I'll very briefly uh, describe the region, which is something Anybody who's a scholar of the Baltic states always has to do, because we have to assume that people don't perhaps know so much about the region, although the Nordic region is very well known, the Baltic one uh, less so. Um, and then I'll explain how I got to the problem um, and the issue that I'm uh, uh, talking about. And then I'll outline the research uh, uh, project, uh, how I'm sort of tackling the issue, my first ideas about it, and so on. But this is still very much a, a, a work in progress, so I will appreciate any comments, any questions, the meetings I had yesterday, the meetings I have today, all of them have been helping me to uh, develop these uh, uh, concepts. So, um, I'm looking at Northern Europe, Northern plus the Baltic states, Northeast Europe, Scandinavia plus others. I, there are all kinds of different terms which are used to describe region. Essentially, probably the best phrase is Northeast Europe, and it's the small countries of Northeast Europe. So the countries which um, have many, many similarities in, in, in size, um, and when I say size, I mean population size. The geographic territory of, of uh, many of these countries, like Finland, uh, Norway, uh, Sweden, even Latvia, which, which often prides itself on being bigger than the Netherlands and the Belgium in terms of its uh, uh, geographic space. Um, the countries are not necessarily geographically small, but when we talk about the population size, we're talking about the small uh, countries of Europe. And remember, small is beautiful. It's good to be a small country, especially in the European Union. These are also democratic states. Um, they're members of the European Union, although the level of integration differs. Some are members of the Euro, uh, some are not. Most are members of NATO, some having joined only very recently. Um, so Russia isn't part of this project. Germany, Poland, as large countries, not part of this project. And also those who would like to be Nordic, like Scotland, where Scottish nationalists base their appeal on independence around the idea of, look over there, look at Norway, look at Denmark. That's what we could be like if we could get rid of these English 
and seize what little oil we have left and the opportunities of being a small state and, and uh, uh, go into our great future. So it's these eight countries, Nordic five and five and Baltic three, the B3. Um, now, these countries have a long history of contacts, especially, of course, the Nordic states between themselves and the Baltic states also between themselves. But let's not forget that historically, um, Denmark has had a uh, presence in the Baltic region. Most famously, the Danish flag appeared from the heavens in Tallinn, right? So um, uh, in a sense, you could say that Estonia is, is very much central to the folklore of Danish national identity. And of course, Sweden occupied much of these territories, uh, pretty much all of Estonia, uh, Latvia, parts of uh, uh, Lithuania, also many centuries ago. And Riga was the second biggest city. Uh, but Riga, the capital of Latvia, was the second biggest city of uh, the Swedish uh, Empire behind uh, uh, Stockholm. So there's a long history of uh, integration, cooperation across the Baltic Sea, which came to a, you could say, in, in a sense, a shuddering halt about 100 years ago, when the trajectories of these countries up until then had been reasonably similar. Yes, of course, the Baltic states, including Finland at that time, as the fourth Baltic state, were absorbed into uh, the Russian Empire. And then we had formerly the Swedish empires, the Danish empires, which of course shriveled up into the smaller nation states that they are today. But really the great divergence in the region began a hundred uh, years ago. And it was an economic divergence. Because broadly speaking, the levels of economic development in the urban centers of the Nordic Baltic region were very similar 100 years ago. Stockholm wasn't especially richer than Riga. Riga at that time was an industrial uh, uh, and financial hub. Um, foreign banks uh, wanting to be based in the, the then booming Russian Empire in the late 19th century, early 20th century, based their banks in Riga, much in the same way that banks have wanted to access the uh, Chinese market 30 years ago based themselves in Hong Kong, right? Uh, in a safe jurisdiction at that time under more or less German administration and more or less adaptations of German law. And this access to capital led to a booming local um, industrial manufacturing sector, making everything from uh, bicycles, then in the same factory they moved on to motorbikes, then they moved on to cars, which tended to blow up, so we stopped building those cars. Uh, also aeroplanes, and all other kinds of manufactured goods, chemicals, and, and, and so on, in Riga. And all this came to a halt at the start of the First World War, when these factories literally were packed up into trains and taken off to uh, the Russian interior, so they couldn't be seized by marauding armies. And the banks retreated back to their home countries, taking as much of the capital as they, as they had uh, uh, that they could save back with them. The banks didn't return after the First World War, and of course the industrial e e manufacturing equipment didn't return. And so at this stage, the Baltic states had to rebuild their economies, war-torn economies from scratch, and of course Sweden, Denmark, and so on were largely untouched by the war. And then the Second World War exacerbated this even further. Baltic states, including the capital cities, were absolutely devastated by war, you know, the, the, the armies marauding across the territories, whereas Sweden is the country that benefited most from the Second World War by selling its uh, raw resources to uh, Germany throughout the uh, war period, um, and I think it was the only country with a growing GDP throughout the um, uh, years of the Second World War. And similarly, other countries, these other uh, Nordic countries were untouched. And then on top of it, at the end of the Second World War, the Baltic states got the perhaps less than logical um, guided hand of the Soviet Union in developing their economies, while the Nordic countries got the Marshall Plan. And so an even greater divergence continued. So when we get to the 1990s and um, the uh, re-emergence of the Baltic states as independent states, 
There were huge disparities, social, yes, political, yes, but especially economic between the region. And those economic differences are really what lie at the heart of the um, differences, the way in which we look at each other, the stereotypes, if you like, that exist um, uh, across the uh, Nordic uh, Baltic region. And, uh, and I could add, of course, that um, the situation was probably exacerbated because in the 1990s, there was no Marshall Plan for East Central Europe. So there was no huge infusion of cash into the Baltic states or the other post-communist countries to rebuild their infrastructures or, or to deal indeed with the economic crisis. You had very small bridging loans coming from international banks, uh, so the IMF, World Bank, the European institutions. And in place of capital, what did we do? Well, we sent experts to the Baltic states, right? And so these experts would advise on how best to structure courts, how to remake your public administration and so on. And certainly they had an impact, but the, the, the economic side of it was neglected. And this, of course, is the era of the Washington Consensus, when um, uh, these international lending banks were saying, no, 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 you don't want to have an industrial policy. You don't want your governments guiding the way in which the economy should develop. That should all be left to the invisible hand. That should be left to the market. And I think everybody except maybe the IMF and the World Bank admits that that was a mistake. Even Je uh, Jeffrey Sachs, who was one of the architects of the programs in Russia and Poland um, and, and also in Estonia, um, admitted in 1999, in an article, a, a mea culpa said, I got it wrong, right? The role of the state should be bigger. We neglected civil society and, and all kinds of other things. But anyway, um, so, so this is to say that these economic differences have endured. Now, um, on top of this, um, well, and, and I should say, actually the Baltic states have, have had great economic su success despite not perhaps having this sort of Marshall Plan type um, uh, assistance. Um, uh, in the 21st century, the three Baltic states are the three fastest growing economies in the European Union. Lithuania first, Estonia second, and, and, and Latvia lagging behind. But the three fastest growing um, uh, economies. Um, Russia, at the time of independence in 1991, had a far higher GDP per capita than the three Baltic states. And of course, oodles and oodles of oil, gas, um, uh, and other natural mineral resources. Well, ever since 2015, 2014, 2015, all three Baltic states have had a higher GDP than Russia. And for a long time before that, they were by far the wealthiest of the successor states of the Soviet Union. So there has been some kind of economic development. And there's been significant, I would say, political development, social development, and change. And I've been fortunate enough to witness this over the last 30 years, living and working in the Baltic states. But what's really struck me is that these changes, these really fundamental changes, are not understood, or they're not communicated, or they haven't gotten through to people. And there are a couple of moments um, that I, well, actually I can refer to many moments when this has sort of come on my consciousness, but I, I'll mention just, just one recent moment, this summer before I came here, which reiterated sort of my interest in this theme and, 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 and something that I read in a book um, uh, just last week, a very typical entry in a book about the Baltic state. So um, I was attending a diplomatic event last year. I, I, I won't say which uh, uh, country. Uh, and as usual, there are some nice things that people say at the start and the ambassadors you know, come and they say, well, thank you for attending our event. And then they make some comments. And this particular ambassador made several comments, and this is a, a Western uh, uh, ambassador, an, an ally, uh, said, you know, <coughs> Latvia is a great country, but you know, you should really think about your political system. You should think about democracy. Democracy is important. You, 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 must, you must work much harder at growing your institutions and developing your democracy and so on. And I thought, what? I mean, for one thing, at a kind of like intuitive level, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> because at that time, um, our president was somebody who you would want as a president if you were you know, taking it from a book. Somebody with an international education who had served as ten, 10 years as a judge on the European Court of Human Rights, and then 15 years 
on actually almost 20 years um, on the European Court of Justice in the European Union, the highest courts in Europe, and then returned to Latvia. Proved to be relatively unpopular amongst the public, but let's say on paper, just the kind of president measured, reasonable, democratic, humanitarian that you would want. And our prime minister at the time was a, a graduate um, of an Ivy League University, PhD in philology, um, with a business uh, a, a background, spoke fluent German, French, and so on, very much a, a, a person of the world. And the head of state of the country, uh, of which his diplomat speaking, is very, very different to that, shall we say. And even today, when we look at the political leaders of the Baltic states, so at the moment, the three prime ministers of the Baltic states are all young, by which I mean younger than me, that's the classification <coughs> I use, uh, young um, women, two liberal-leaning, uh, one cent centrist uh, uh, conservative, who are pushing forward very interesting reform-driven uh, agendas. Last Thursday, Latvia passed into law a uh, same-sex <coughs> uh, partnership uh, uh, legislation, um, and, and, and so on. So really, very forward-looking. And if um, I was to show you a picture of these, these, these three women, or, or to a random audience, I think most people would assume, oh, those are the, you know, the, the prime ministers of the Nordic states, or maybe the Benelux states, or something like that. But it breaks the stereotype of this sort of gray, boring, um, uh, uh, post-Soviet functionary Lukashenko-type leader, which maybe people associate. And the second thing is just a little throwaway thing in a book, a rare book that looked at both the Nordic and Baltic regions, looking at uh, economic development, uh, written by uh, Hermann Hilmarsson, a, uh, a fine economist from uh, uh, Iceland, but which had a little throwaway thing in it, which is just so typical of books which have throwaway comments about the Baltic states, where he said, you know, a little section, just a couple of paragraphs, talking about how the Baltic states lack democracy. And the example he used was, well, look, the Baltic states did not have a referendum on joining the euro. And I thought, well, hang on. I can only remember one country, and I, I looked it up. It's only one country of the 20-something which had the euro ever had a referendum on joining the euro. That was Denmark. Finland didn't have a referendum. Sweden didn't have a referendum on rejecting uh, the euro. But, you know, this barrier is set high. The Baltic states are supposed to do something which other European Union countries haven't done. And, and that kind of thing is, is very typical. And, and this isn't something new to make this observation. You know, 10 or 11 years ago, Thomas Ilves, uh, the former uh, president of Estonia and denizen of these parts, I uh, spent a long time here at Hoover, um, had a Twitter spat with Paul Krugman when he was still the president of um, uh, Estonia. And this Twitter uh, uh, spat was turned into an opera I don't advise you to watch it. You can see bits of it on, on YouTube if you want, but generally speaking, be, be, be careful. Um, but, um, you know, he uh, uh, had this spat basically saying, well, look, again, we have a wise man telling us what to do. We are East Europeans. We're stupid. We don't know what you're, you're talking about. And this comes up again and again. And it sort of mirrors, perhaps, this divide that we've had between Eastern Europe and Western Europe um, uh, over time. Something which I think is, is captured very nicely by Anatole uh, Levin um, in, a, in a book on um, the Baltic Revolution published in 93, 94, still by far the best book on the Baltic uh, states. Um, and in, in, in it, he refers to the typical attitudes that um, uh, Westerners have to East Europeans, uh, and he's including the Baltic in this. He said that there tend to be two very different approaches. One is to praise the people of the East or the Baltic, saying they are gallant, this is a quote, gallant little freedom-loving peoples, right? battling against some kind of outsider they are, and, and we're applauding them, well done. And then the other, other part of the scale is to be very critical of them and, and call them horrid little anti-Semitic peasants when they do something you don't like, like, like perhaps. So, um, I mean, some of the language directed to Hungary recently perhaps would, would fall into that category. But they're never treated for what they possibly actually are, which might be sort of like normalizing <coughs> countries. So this is where the idea for the project comes from, that there exists a divide, that the Baltic states are seen in a way totally different to the Nordic states, and this isn't a criticism of the, of the Nordic states, 
And I'm wondering, well, how based on, on, on fact, how based on evidence is this divide? Now, at this point, you might be asking me, so what? And what does it matter? Why should you spend time working on this? Well, I think there are three reasons why these perceptions or these stereotypes are important. The first is they do have an economic impact. If you have a positive image, you're more likely to attract foreign direct investment. Right? You're seen as a safer, more positive destination. It also affects things like tourist flows, you know, how safe are we, how nice a place is this, do people know about it? And it also adds value to your products. Just look at, at how much chairs which have Danish design have on them will cost in probably some fine boutique here in Palo Alto. And that chair is probably actually designed and made in Lithuania, right? Uh, just under a, uh, under a Danish company. But you can add value to your products um, by having this kind of like you know, positive um, uh, uh, remark. The second is there's also a political impact to how you are identified. And this is especially so in the foreign policy climate. And I was thinking about this last week when I was watching your great uh, presidential uh, candidate debates. And there was the GOP debate, um, which uh, scared the willies out of me. Um, uh, but um, in this debate, Chris Christie made reference to, like, you know, if we don't stop Putin in <coughs> Ukraine, then, you know, the Baltic states are next. And the audience, those who were aware of the Baltic states, all of them realized this meant Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and not Finland, which a hundred years ago was the fourth Baltic state. And that's how it was recorded on the New York Times and elsewhere. You know, the great success of Finland is to have divorced itself, let's say, from this region, identified itself with the Nordic states, and be free from these kind of uh, 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 perceptions, and, uh, which can have direct security implications. And then the third level is what in stereotype literature is called the auto-stereotype, how we see ourselves. Um, because how we see ourselves is also influenced by how others see us. And a negative auto-stereotype can make us feel perhaps a little down in the dumps. Now, I didn't grow up in America, but my wife did. So she inflicted Dr. Seuss on our children. I still don't get it, right? But maybe some of you have read Dr. Seuss? Yeah, I've seen some nods here. And maybe you've read The Sneetches. Well, this is what it, so The Sneetches is a simple tale, but The Sneetches are a group of creatures who are all the same, except one part of The Sneetches have a star on their chests, and the others don't. And the star, which adds no value to their characters or, or anything else, is perceived to be a good thing. And so those who have the star strut around like the masters of the universe, while those who don't are a little depressed. And of course, the story develops, but we don't need to go into that. But that's really what we're talking about here. That, um, you know, the, the depressed Nietzsche's are depressed not just because they're sort of looked down upon, but also because they feel that, well, they must be right to look down upon us. We must be failures. We must be doing something terribly, awfully wrong. And that's why I think this, this, this stuff is important. And we can find plenty of evidence for how this plays out in real life. So um, the biggest money laundering scandal in the Baltic states was in Estonia, a Danish bank, Danske Bank, which received an enormous several billion dollar fine from the US government for laundering 200 billion, 200 billion euros of uh, mostly Russian money through its bank. But that's kind of been brushed off, and Danske Bank continues. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, a Latvian bank was closed down for, and at the moment the case going through court, is for laundering 2 billion euros. And this led to a fundamental restructuring of the banking system, Latvia, probably necessary. But there was no such restructuring of you know, the Danish banking system, and no real sort of big doubts and worries even though the scale of the money laundering appears to have been 100 times bigger. So this is what, what the auto-stereotype is, but it can feed into your own perception of yourself and make you perhaps feel um, uh, a little bad. So in the research, what I'm doing is looking at the stereotypes, which are known as xeno-stereotypes. So a, a national stereotype of a, of a, a people or of a region is a, a xeno-stereotype. And I'm wondering, how do these xeno-stereotypes form? How do they change? 
and also trying to think about, well, what are the Zeno stereotypes that we have in Northern Europe, in the Baltic region and in the Nordic region? And broadly speaking, um, Zeno stereotypes develop in two ways. They form over a long period of time. So as we grow up, we watch the news, we hear our parents talking, we read school textbooks and so on. And over time, these visions of a certain place develop. And I think this is what we have with the Nordics, which first came on the um, American consciousness in the mid-1930s in a, a book by Marquis Child praising the sort of third way which um, uh, Sweden had adopted uh, to get out of the economic crisis. And ever since then, we've had a string of positive books um, um, uh, about the region. And I, have, I don't have those slides with me, but I could show you tens of slides of books about you know, how wonderful the Nordics are, about Kuga, um, which from what I gather is a feeling of well-being, but apparently has become a thing, um, about how to organize a good fika, um, about how wonderful the Nordic people are, how wonderful the system is. And there's a lot of truth to this, of course. You know, the, the Nordic model is successful. It's challenged by some people on the right who describe a nanny state. But in a book called The uh, Swedish Theory of Love, published by uh, University of Washington Press, translated from the Swedish, you can actually see how the Nordic model has developed over time, hand in hand with, with political thought since um, the, the, the late 18th uh, century. So there is, uh, there is something to it, but a very, very positive image. Well, what about the Baltics? Well, the other way in which Zeno stereotypes develop is at a critical juncture. When something happens, and all of a sudden, something which maybe people haven't thought about so much appears on their consciousness. So over the last two years, we could talk about Ukraine, <coughs> which the shock of the war, the conflict, and so on, led to Ukraine radically changing the maybe Zeno stereotype that it had before, of being some grim, grayish, post-Soviet country, to being um, the gallant little freedom-loving peoples um, uh, uh, that we talk about, right? Um, and which, of course, is true. And Ukraine has developed a much more positive um, image. What about the Baltics? Well, the Baltic image, I think, developed in the 1990s. And when I took a look at headlines uh, featuring Baltic, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, you can see that there's a jump in the New York Times in terms of um, headlines in 1990, 91, 92, 93, 94, then it disappears, then it comes back during the great economic crisis in 2008, 9, and then it tails off again. So at, at, at sort of negative periods of the Baltic development, there have been lots of stories about them. And those times were nuts. I mean, when I moved to the Baltics in 93, there were a lot of nutty things uh, going on. I mean, we had mass prison breaks. I was rereading the newspapers from that time a couple of years ago. And, you know, there was like a throwaway story, page seven on the bottom, you know, 88 people es escaped from a prison in Leopardia. <laughs> All right, wow, okay. Um, pensions were unpaid. In Estonia, in 1992, a monarchist party was elected to parliament, right, which wanted to introduce a monarchy into um, Estonia, um, uh, which is a little bit perhaps out of sync with the times. In 1993, the Latvian president went on his first uh, state visit to Lithuania by car. And on the way back, the car was seized by a group of rogue policemen. So actually people who were pretending to be policemen. And um, uh, they, they seized the whole, you know, there were five or six cars in the quarter, and they were made to pay. Uh, uh, I, I think it wasn't exactly clear in the news article to be uh, uh, released, you know. It was, it was a you know, very odd uh, time indeed. But all this is kind of like reflects negatively on the Baltic steps. It's really good copy for newspapers. It's interesting stuff to read, but it's what stays in people's mind because it's a critical juncture. And then we start talking about the Baltics, except in some niche publications like you know, The Economist, perhaps, and, or The Financial Times. And what stays with people is this perception, which was developed at this crucial juncture. And stereotypes are sticky. They do change a little bit over time, but they change relatively slowly. So I think this is something which, which, which is important. Um, but the stereotype of the Baltic states which exist they are based on the 1990s. And that certainly seems to be the case. I mean, I, I, I don't have time to go into too much detail on how I'm looking at this, 
Um, I've mostly used some qualitative um, uh, indica indications like, you know, the type of books that we have available on the region. Um, uh, I also looked at um, how we deal with these issues ourselves in our public diplomacy. And even Estonia's public diplomacy organization has a page where they talk about, well, what are the stereotypes of the Baltic states? And they mention six of them. And two of them are, number one, it's scary Eastern Europe. And number two, we are living in the Stone Age. So even progressive Estonia understands that, you know, the way in which we're perceived outside our borders are um, a little bit, you know, less than ideal. And I mean, there are ways in getting quantitative data, um, uh, doing a modification of the Harvard implicit association test is something which, which I intend to do, as well as uh, 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 possibly ordering some social survey uh, data. But I think it's clear that there is a difference in, in, in perceptions, although the data here needs to be firmed up. And then the second part of the research is to do a sort of state of the region review. Well, how true are these stereotypes? How far have the Baltic states moved on? And, how, and also, how far have the Nordic states changed over time? And to do this, I'll use the, uh, the Nordic model, which is this Nordic model of state, government, and so on, which has three elements, which differ between all the countries, but we can still make generalizations about what they are. The first is the political model, where I'm convinced that we've seen a great deal of congruence um, over time. And the differences in how our political systems have very much con con converged. Um, again, despite the Zeno stereotype. Then um, I'm looking at the, the other two elements of the Nordic model, which is the economic model and the social model. And these two things are combined. Because to have a social model like the Nordic states, you need a lot of money. And when we look at the Baltic states, they have actually adopted the social model of the Nordic countries. When it comes to paternity benefits, maternity benefits, state pensions, state health care, all the different aspects of welfare policy, uh, either free or exceedingly heavily subsidized higher education, and so on. All these things from the Nordics have been taken on. But the difference that remains is capital and capital accumulation in these, these countries. And this is when it's useful to refer to uh, another denizen of these part, parts, Francis Fukuyama, who um, about 20 years ago wrote in a book on state formation um, about a stateness matrix. And in a state, stateness matrix, the Y axis is the strength of a state and the ability to execute policy. Uh, and the x-axis is the scope of state functions. So the basic idea is states can choose how much they want to do, right? So you can do everything, fix all the roads, give everybody health care, have a fine um, uh, education system and so on, but that costs a lot of money and it's very expensive to deliver it. So those countries that have lots of resources, they can so be at this extreme, they can offer a lot of services, and they have the capital to deliver those at a high level as well. However, other countries like the Baltic States, they choose to deliver the same amount of services, probably because of uh, uh, the Nordic model being so close and, and, and we so often base ourselves in the things that we do on the Nordics, which are seen as doing most things correctly. So we do almost the same things that they do, but we lack the capital to deliver it at the same level. And that's important. Because if you look at a healthcare system, healthcare systems are important, but the cost of healthcare is the same, more or less, between um, wealthy states and poorer states. A CT scanner costs whatever it costs. Pharmaceuticals cost whatever they cost, with very little price differentiation between countries. And so if you have less capital available, you will be able to deliver a less qualitative service. And I think but that's where the Baltic states are. They are Nordic in their political system. They're Nordic in the shape of their economies, how budgets are, are developed through the process of talking to trade unions, uh, talking to uh, uh, business organizations, and, and, and so on. They offer the scope of services of the Nordics, but they simply lack the capital. 
And part of the problem of sort of, you know, getting up to, to the uh, Nordic level is a, is a sort of negative perception of them um, uh, in the world, which hampers a little bit this um, uh, development. So at this point, I think, Amir, I, I've spoken for, as I always do, right? I mean, you have to bear in mind, I haven't um, been teaching this semester, so I've been dying to crawl up onto a stage and talk to people. So, so that's why I talked a little bit longer. My apologies, uh, Amir, and, and to the audience. And I'd love to hear um, uh, ideas, comments, questions, and so on from the audience, but I'll hand over to Amir at this point. Well, thanks for questions, but let me start rolling the, the ball. How do we account for the endurance of this dissonance between the Zeno and the auto stereotypes. And it brings to uh, my uh, recollection one of these fantastic documents in the British archives about uh, the Baltic states in 1940, immediately after the collapse of uh, independence, when a, a British diplomat uh, wrote to London from Riga that at the end of the day, we don't have much to share, share for this parasitic fascist country and all the others, just like all other tribes like the Armenians and the Welsh, that is the, the British, uh, <laughs> the postulate that they deserve independence is simply fallacious. Fast forward to a few years ago, and you don't name your diplomatic sources, I will not name mine, but uh, with a, a meeting with the German officials and military uh, officers, almost the same story about uh, Article 5 of uh, the um, uh, NATO Charter, that uh, it was almost uh, an offhand off uh, comment. You don't really believe that we will fight the Russians for these little midgets. Direct translation, etc. So they still don't deserve it. And after all the reforms and the democratization and everything that you so eloquently uh, described for us, what accounts for this enduring uh, dissonance between the self-perception and the ongoing perception of countries that are actually supposed to be exactly what we wanted every post-Soviet Republic to be, mm -hmm. to complete the transformation? Why it is still out there? I mean, the this is an excellent question, and, and I go back to the concept of critical junctures. <laughs> made up their minds, um, or, or, or these, these stereotypes were formed in the 1990s, um, when for your generals and so on, they were probably at quite a formative age, and it sticks with them. And even though rational, rationally, maybe if they've been to the region, they might see that things are different, but intrinsically, it's quite difficult to change because we all have these biases, whether we are aware of them or not. So for me, for example, I, I grew up in a small town in the middle of England, and I was you know, frequently told that you know, if I don't work hard, if I don't study, you know, if I don't make an effort, you know, I'll have to go live in Ireland. Like, nothing better will become me. Right? I'll have to go live in Ireland. Because Ireland at that time was the poorest country in the European Union. It was by far the most backward region. Um, kind of like, for those who know Latvia, kind of like Latgale is to the rest of, of, of Europe. And that stayed with me. And today, of course, Ireland is the second wealthiest country in the European Union, uh, GDP per capita or income per, per capita after Luxembourg. It's the only country which has fundamentally remade its um, economic story. But for me, and I think many other Brits of my generation, we still instinctively find it difficult to, like, I mean, my first instinct is, oh, is it, is it like that? And then, of course, the rational part of me maybe eventually takes over. So, so that would be one exp uh, ex uh, explanation. And the other one might well be this, this, this economic perception. Um, because economically, of course, you know, especially when it comes to the military, the same thing applies. You know, a tank costs what a tank costs. And if you have a bigger population, more capital, more, more, more tax income, you can buy more tanks, like Sweden and Finland can, and Latvia can buy less. And so there is a, a, a noticeable economic difference still. But those are the two arguments that I would have, and if anybody has uh, uh, other ideas, I'd love to uh, uh, hear them. Brian, you're on. I'm curious, um, when we talk about ortho stereotypes and Zeno stereotypes within the Baltic regions, how much you see the Zeno stereotype of Russians as 
impacting the ortho stereotype. And especially when we're talking, for instance, about the shutdown of TV Doge and things like that, that uh, Latvia's policy towards ethnic Russians in particular is kind of coming across here amidst um, the war in Ukraine. Um, how much do you think that current policy is informed by history and geopolitical concerns versus stereotypes of the Russian other within the Baltic states? So uh, are we talking about Zeno stereotypes now, how others look at the Baltic region considering I, I, this? I'm talking about within the Baltic region, how they consider the stereotype of even further east uh, Russian and perhaps trying to redefine themselves as an Eastern European uh, polity that isn't this backward, you know, sort of group like those other guys. Well, I mean, the, the, I think the, the Nordic, uh, sorry, the Baltic governments would definitely challenge your idea of East European already. They would point out that, you know, for the last 20 years, by the United Nations definition, the Baltic states are Northern Europe. Um, and there are, of course, explicit attempts to relocate to the North, most explicitly um, Estonia. Um, Estonia, 20 years ago, uh, considered changing its flag from the current three uh, horizontal stripes to the, a, a Nordic cross type thing, to identify itself visibly um, uh, with uh, the Nordic states. And then, of course, you have, again, the great uh, uh, President Ilvest, who in 1999, I think at the Swedish Foreign Policy Institute, made this speech, which is quite famous in the region, about the Yule countries, um, uh, where he talked about, you know, Estonia, we call Christmas time Yule time. And Finland does too, so does Sweden, so does Norway, so does the UK. So let's form a new bloc, right? Let's get rid of the Nordics, get rid of the Baltics, and create the Yule countries. Now, of course, it sounds comical, which is the main reason the idea didn't take place. But this is part of a concerted effort to try to divorce itself from the Baltics mm -hmm. and get into the Nordics. So the, the Baltic political leaders definitely identify themselves there. However, amongst the Baltic publics, the auto stereotype probably is less defined and it would be quite socially segmented how people see themselves. I would say blue collar workers would definitely grumble more that garbage is your Eastern Europe underpaid and so on. Um, and uh, while elites, lawyers and so on would definitely try to position themselves there. As for views of um, the East, well, generally the Baltic states, but the um, Estonian, Lat Latvian and Lithuanian particular communities, they would have a very negative opinion, broadly speaking, of Russia. They see Russia as the other, um, and apart from some economic benefits that might be gained by trade with them, they see very little of value to be added there. But then you have this 20% of the population in Estonia, about 30% uh, of the population in Latvia, who are of course Russian speaking, and who look at it totally differently, and who identify themselves with Russia just as much as they would with um, uh, Europe and, 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 and Latvia and so on, and probably feel a bit put upon um, at, at the moment, um, as you pointed out. How do Latvians see them? Well, that's a, that's a tough one. But I would say that broadly speaking, they still see uh, the, the Russian speakers as the other. We had a great conversation about this yesterday um, uh, uh, when we were talking about radical right with, with a group of, uh, of students and researchers. Um, and um, we talk, talked about the fact that both Estonian and especially, I think, Latvian society is quite segmented. So up until, well, actually, at the moment we still have them, but they'll be phased out next year. We have separate school streams, Russian speaking and Latvian. In civil society, we have separate civil societies, you know, as a Russian speaking theater, Latvian speaking theaters, and so on. And so society has been quite divided. And because it's been divided and there have been relatively few opportunities to cross over, um, I think stereotypes have developed and probably negative ones going both ways for Estonians and Latvians to Russian speakers and Russian speakers back to um, Estonians and Latvians. So uh, I hope this long-winded answer got there in the end. Very much, yeah. Okay, thanks for the question. Yeah. Uh, my question is actually, uh, I think, fairly closely related to grants. You've presented the Baltics here to us as sort of a unified entity. And so I was curious whether there are stereotypes among the Baltic states Estonians, Lithuanians, Lithuanians, etc., mm. and also, um, in addition to the stereotypes, perhaps some very real, particularly economic factors that might differentiate the states. Um, so I'm wondering, sort of, whether 
whether you might whether that might um, change in any way your um, research on stereotypes. Yeah. So um, within the Baltics, I mean, we all hate the Estonians <laughs> because they're perceived as being successful. Even though Lithuania now has a higher GDP per capita, um, they only took Estonia about two years ago, there's still a perception that the Estonians are better. And the Estonians will tell you, ah, their GDP only grew because you know, they had demographic flight from the country, you know, and so on. But Lithuania's success is built on real solid um, uh, economic uh, uh, bases. But yeah, so <laughs> there is something about the Estonians, and I'm sure the Estonians look down at the Latvians and Lithuanians um, in a vaguely patronizing way as well, you know, because we've done better. But, but we, we, we talked about this this morning with a group of students. It's interesting how this works. So, you know, the Estonians maybe look down at the Latvians and Lithuanians in the same way that the Finns have a very paternalistic attitude looking down to the Estonians, and then the Swedes look at the Finns in a very paternalistic way. And I don't know, maybe somebody looks at the Swedes in a paternalistic way. I don't know about that. But so there is this tendency, mostly to do with economic success, to look down at each other. There are stereotypes that the, that the Estonians are slow. Not mentally, but they, they, they speak slowly <laughs> and do things slowly. And, and, but you know, these are very broad, broad stereotypes. Economic differences, absolutely. The big economic difference is Latvia. Uh, Latvia lags well behind Estonia and Lithuania in terms of its GDP. GDP per capita by about a decade uh, now. Um, if we look at the European Union average, so average GDP per capita is, is 100%. And then, for example, Ireland is somewhere around 140% of the average. Um, Lithuania and Estonia are neck and neck at around 90% of the average. So getting up to the European Union average, Latvia is stuck somewhere around 73, 74%. It was recently overtaken by uh, Romania. So this is quite a fundamental um, economic difference because, of course, um, economic success is a part of your Zeno stereotype. Um, a Zeno stereotype is really based on real things. I mean, if you wanted to change, it has to be based on, on something real. It's not just about how you sell yourself, about the nation branding or something else. It, it has to be based on firm foundations. And with Latvia lagging so far behind, um, there is a danger that it could be left behind and, and be a Balkan country rather than a Baltic country. And Latvian policymakers are well aware of this and, and, and trying to tackle it um, at the moment in various different formats. Uh, has there been much migration from Russia to the Baltic states because of the people wanting to escape Russia because of the war? And if there has been an extensive migration, has it had any impact on the political, economic, Broadly speaking, Baltic borders are closed to uh, new, new Russian migrants. Those who held, and there were several thousand um, uh, families which held, uh, which had purchased basically residence rights because by investing in real estate or in a business, um, this is a program that no longer exists. You could get a a, um, a, a visa, a Schengen visa, for a five or a ten year period. So those people obviously uh, could come in. But um, otherwise, um, no new Russian migrants have uh, come in. But <coughs> tensions exist, uh, not so much between Russian speakers, but between um, Ukrainian refugees, which are substantial numbers of Baltic states, have been very open to absorbing refugees. Famously, Estonia has the highest number of uh, uh, Ukrainian refugees per capita of any, any country, more so even than uh, uh, Poland. And this has led to some kind of conflicts between Russians and Ukrainians, uh, with Russian speakers perhaps feeling that, well, you know, why are we being so welcoming to these guys when you know, they've been less welcoming to us for the last 30 years. So those tensions um, uh, exist. Um, um, uh, I'm interested in your research on Russia and They are viewed within the European consciousness as like Eastern European as opposed to Northern European. Do a different set of stereotypes or the same apply when looking at more international partners like India, China, Japan? Do they still view them through the same lens of these stereotypes, or do they have a different set of stereotypes entirely within 
So who, who would be doing the looking? Um, the countries like China, Japan, India, too. So the way that they look upon a region. Yeah. Well, to be honest, I think that with countries like China and India, they simply don't know the Baltics exist, which is another challenge. A Zeno stereotype can only exist if you are aware of these communities. I mean, I, I gave a talk at Fudan University in Shanghai about six years ago, where I sort of, you know, began with the usual thing, you know, who's heard of the Baltic states? Nothing. I'm like, oh, God, it's going to be one of those. Which is quite strange, because they were coming to a talk about the Baltic. <laughs> um, 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 and it took a long time to explain, and people were perplexed. They're like, so the, the Baltic states together have a population of about five and a half million people. And of course, Shanghai is 20 million plus. <laughs> and so uh, there, there were questions about this. Like, so five and a half million people in that territory? You know, and we have 25 million in this tiny little urban area about the same size as the Riga metropolitan region. Um, so I, I think that, that, that there's simply a a lack of knowledge about the, the, the region. And it's interesting, and we haven't talked about this so much today, but it's interesting that that's not a challenge to the Nordics. Because the Nordic states, of course, themselves are very small. They have a joint population of, what, 20, 25 million people. So quite compact for, for, for five states. But they have this very great public image um, that everybody knows what the Nordics are. I mean, I could ask you, what do you associate with the Nordic states? ABBA? <laughs> Ikea, um, Vikings, the, the, the Swedish public diplomacy agency, which is called the Swedish Institute, has this fantastic poster that they have, which has just the symbols of Sweden, just Sweden, right? the symbols of Sweden, and it takes, a, 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 and it has maybe 50 symbols in it, all of which are familiar to us, including things like H&M, and, 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 and you know, uh, corporate brands, Spotify, and so on, as well as uh, um, uh, these older things. So the Nordics have this great, great public image. Um, everybody knows them around the world, and it's broadly speaking a positive thing. I mean, what's not to like about ABBA? <coughs> right? So there's a, quite a lot. Wow, I guess the leather jacket tells us uh, quite a lot of you. <laughs> Uh, but, um, but so this is really one, one of the challenges of the Baltics also to get themselves known a little bit. And uh, because there are things about the Baltics which are unique, uh, uh, song festivals, uh, uh, for example, but you have to get out there and it has to be based on some kind of real success to, to, to communicate this uniqueness. And that hasn't happened. So I hope that sort of addresses you. Thank you. So, um, former. Soviet republics like uh, Belarus and Hungary have dominated the headlines in recent years for their tilts towards authoritarianism. And so people look at the headlines. What, to what extent do you think that serves as a signal for how to think about the Baltic regions? If they are authoritarian, if they have troubles with their state form of government or democracy, then it must be the case for Baltic regions too. You're bang on. I, I think you're absolutely right. I had an email exchange with an old colleague of mine who is a professor at a university in Denmark, and we worked together in the Baltic States in the mid-1990s. Mid and my friend, he had a pretty bad time in, 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 in the Baltic. So he and his wife didn't really enjoy living there. The, the challenges of living in Riga in 1995 were quite tough. You know, there were still days when there was no hot water, for example, so hot water was centralized. All these things which have disappeared long ago. And this has affected his thinking. So uh, we were having an email exchange about something else, and then he you know, asked me what I was doing at UW, and I explained this, this project, and he wrote back to me and said, ah, oh, but you know, come on, I mean, you guys are diverging, all that, uh, you know, all this corruption, this um, democratic backsliding, authoritarianism, and so on. And I sent him sort of a very long, boring email explaining why I didn't fully agree with him. And he said, oh yeah, I guess you're right. I've just been thinking about Hungary. <laughs> said, and, and yeah. So I think that because the Baltics are perhaps less visible, when there are trends happening in other places which are closely associated with the Baltics, these trends, you know, there's an assumption that, that this is happening there. But when it comes to democracy, for example, the three Baltic states are amongst the very, very rare countries in the world that in all democracy indexes, whether it's the IDEA, Liberal Democracy Index, or the Freedom House uh, Index, in all democracies have improved their ranking, all of them. Um, uh, uh, so it's, it's very different to Hungary and, uh, and, and the USA, which is 
slid down the rankings and, and, and other places. I know, follow up to the previous question. Uh, you seem to be uh, corrected your own hypothesis in responding to the previous question. So you previously said that uh, the bolts are uh, stereotypes based on, on their own experience in the early post-Soviet years. Now you are saying that they are stereotyped based on other experience in the recent years. No, not on their experience, but on Hungarians or Russians or Belarusians or whoever. So my alternative suggestion would be maybe it's just plain Orientalism. So you are you are part of that unknown eastern terrain, and you are stuck there. No matter how you economically develop, no no no, no matter how you democratically develop, you are once part of Eastern Europe, always part of Eastern Europe. Yeah, I mean that's a good. Thing. I mean Edward Said is something which I think is uh, Orientalism. I reread um, at, at the start of this project, and I think there is a certain truth to this. I mean, after all, we've been talking about this divide between Eastern Europe, or Central Europe, or whichever term we, we, we care to use, and Western Europe for a good 200 years or so. And, you know, despite, I mean, if you look at the economic data, actually, it's quite interesting that the European Union um, divides its 27 countries into regions. And these functional regions um, uh, exist for bookkeeping purposes. This is how money is distributed for um, uh, various different funds and so on. And as I recall, one of the top three wealthiest regions. So I asked my students, and I, I have a lot of international students in my classes in Latvia, to say, well, what do you think of the richest places in Europe? And the one they always miss are um, the former Czechoslovakia. Because both around Prague and around Bratislava, those regions are now amongst the wealthiest in Europe, largely because of the manufacturing that developed. You know, the car industry was virtually shifted from Germany to uh, over there, but services developed and so on. And it's, you know, people just don't think that, you know, Eastern Europe could possibly uh, uh, develop in some way. So, yeah, thank you for, for, for the comment. Sir. Yes, I, first, uh, Tifar, so first initial follow-up to um, that point is, how much of it is, again, just the uh, lack of knowledge that it's uh, Czechia, or if you go back a century ago, even before the Great War, it was actually quite we like economically, uh, industrially relevant Europe. I mean, the great powers, Austria, Hungary, they were actually quite the up there. So some say, really, it's just, especially for Czechia, it's a reversion of the mean now that they are back to parity with, I think now, Italy, Spain, close to UK and France, so by now, in terms of uh, income, you want to adjust for Well, I mean, well past it. I mean, Italy has about the same GDP as Latvia. That's how now, Italy, Italy because I think Czechia, I think they're now up to UK by now, just uh, going about where things are. And then secondly, uh, more specific, not just the Baltics, but that whole region of Eastern Europe, have they been really making an effort, because you know, India have been doing quite a lot, or Poland and India, they've been trying to build the high highs and economic ties, but have they been engaging the uh, fast growing emerging economies, not just India, also the Southeast Asia, much of Africa, where, because down the line, just because of demographic and economic trajectories that derive from the demographic trajectories, those would very likely be in positions of influence a decades ahead. So are those in the Baltics, are they making an effort to build uh, diplomatic and economic linkages because that, in my mind, that might help overcome the level of just ignorance or just lack of awareness that you actually saw in uh, Shanghai. Yeah, I mean, size matters, yeah. And I think the challenge is well, that the diplomatic cores of the three Baltic states are relatively small. They have to be sensible in where they spend money because you can't cover the whole world, of course, with diplomatic representations because then there, no pensions would be paid um, uh, in the Baltics. So I don't think that they have really engaged as much as they should. I'm sure that all three countries have diplomatic representations that cover that region, but probably they don't have specific representations in each country. But then there's also the issue of how interested those countries are in, in the Baltic. We could take the example of China. So the, China, uh, um, the uh, Baltic states have recently broken with the uh, People's Republic of China, basically. It's broken away from the uh, 17 plus 1 um, uh, Belt and Road Initiative and so on, 
First of all, Lithuania by adopting a very, very pro-Taiwanese policy, and then Latvia and Estonia have uh, followed. And then there was a concern about, oh, you know, what's this going to mean for investment? And then it turned out there was almost no Chinese investment um, uh, in the region. Uh, the biggest Chinese investment in Latvia, for example, was uh, private property purchases. So there was a boom when people were buying these residency permits that I mentioned about 10 years ago. But in terms of economic investments um, in manufacturing or services, the Baltic states just don't figure on the map of uh, uh, China. And I think it might be something similar to the other emerging economies. They see far more attractive places, which they are aware of. And, and this is the thing, just, just if I can diverge for one point. A couple of years ago, um, I was organizing a conference uh, together with some colleagues on these kind of like economic development issues. And we had one of the partners of Deloitte uh, coming from the, the office in Benelux. And this was a partner who works on helping businesses relocate. So, you know, somewhere, let's say some Swedish business wants to relocate its back office or maybe it's manufacturing somewhere else in the world and they help them relocate. And this is, I think, 2016. And we had uh, this chap come and he said, oh, this is great. It's my first time in the Baltic States. I'd never really thought about them before. You know, uh, I love Riga. Maybe we can have this as a destination, you know, in, in the future. We need to do more research. So it's just, you know, in bigger countries, there's simply lack of an interest in in, in peripheral regions, and we should remember the Baltic states are <coughs> peripheral regions, they're not the center of Europe, they are at, at the edge. Uh, I would like to thank you so much for a fascinating talk. Uh, and you are absolutely correct, the stereotype remained for a long, long time. And you mentioned Francis Fukuyama, I have seen him many times uh, giving example, Sweden as the example, and I always remind him that I lived in Sweden and I studied Swedish mentality and so on and uh, follow the process. And I know just last month, the Swedish government accepted that they cannot handle anymore the crime and gang stuff. And I always tell to Francis Fukuyama that this is that you are telling to the people is not correct. Please read the Swedish mentality by Professor Okedown, that he spent 20 years with his graduate student and wrote a book and translated in uh, University of Pennsylvania. Be but still, <laughs> even he as a, a most educated person here, one of the most educated, follow the same thing and always give Sweden as a, one of the best country. And it is not because I travel there and I am just getting shocked because Sweden, Sweden now is very different than 40 years ago. Yeah, I, and, and I, I would agree with you that, um, that when we talk about the, the, the stereotypes of the Baltic states are, are trapped in the past, to a certain extent, the stereotypes of the Nordic states are also trapped into the past. The economic systems are a little bit different. The social models have been corrected. This idea of a big state and big spending, well, that's not the case in Denmark. It's not really the case in Sweden um, anymore. And of course, the great ch changes in society with immigration from the 1980s onwards are not really counted for in these these yeah, images. Exactly. Before we thank uh, Professor Auras, I would just say one piece of uh, advice when we study myths and stereotypes, the best thing to do is to go check them personally. <laughs> so go to Riga, Tallinn, and Vilnius, some of the most beautiful places that you can have in Europe, and if you don't fall in love in these places, Thank you so much.